right. Let's see. How's it going? We got some slides loaded up here. That was tighter than you can imagine. I was on a tarmac like 40 minutes ago. All right, good to be here. How's it going so far? Great. Cool. All right. Well, let me start with uh, this is going to be some fun stuff that I've been thinking a lot about when it comes to building products. And I want to start with what I think a lot of you are probably going through right now, which is uh, you're making something. And this is kind of the myth, right? It's sort of awesome when you come up with a new idea and then you start to execute. And then there's like this linear progression towards a successful outcome, when in fact it's more often like this. Um, it's extraordinarily volatile, uh, progressive moments of, oh shit, this is not going to work, and then, oh my goodness, we're onto something, and then, oh, this is not going to work, and this continues on and on and on. And what's interesting about this is that um, in the beginning, you think you have a plan, right? This is when you actually have a course charted for yourself, and then, of course, you realize you can't really plan after all, and the volatility requires so much rethinking and refactoring on an ongoing basis. You're totally self-reliant in the beginning. You think you or just your co-founders can do it all, and then you realize, nope, you're actually more reliant on your team than you realized. So these are some of the things you kind of go through in the beginning, and I like to say the best you can possibly do is aspire for a positive slope. If you can just kind of go progressively in the right direction, you're onto something. So that being said, uh, quick, quick intro about me. Um, so, phase, kind of three quick phases of uh, what I've been thinking about over the years. You know, the first was organizing and empowering the creative world to make ideas happen. Um, started actually as a paper product business to bootstrap our company, um, but this evolved into books, um, uh, conferences, and online tools, and then the network Behance, which was intended to help organize the creative world at work. And over 12 million creatives are now online, you know, using Behance to showcase their work. Um, and I would say that this theme of like chapter one for me was to be a mission-centric and medium-agnostic business. Everyone always says, oh, I'm a tech company, or I'm this, or I'm that. But we always like to say in our team, you know, our mission is to organize the creative world. We'll do it through any medium possible. And so that was, uh, that was one takeaway I had from that first phase. The second phase um, brought us into Adobe. So Adobe acquired us in 2012. And, um, and aside from leading Behance in the company, I took over some new products that certainly challenged me in new ways, building a lot of, taking a lot of the creative tools like Photoshop and Illustrator and that sort of thing to mobile. And so building a ton of different mobile products, all with a services layer um, to try to make a connected creative experience across desktop and mobile. And I think the takeaway from that chapter was that you can make products that are powerful enough for professionals to use, yet accessible to everyone. And what litmus test do you provide for your team to make sure that you're following through in that vision? Phase three, I think I'm still learning from as we are in it right now. Um, but uh, I've, been, I've been an investor, and I don't expect you to read this, but I kind of think about the investment thesis um, from my perspective as design-centric teams that are building interfaces that disintermediate, that dis disintermediate a lot of the things underneath in, in different industries. And um, so a bunch of different investments over the years in teams that are design-driven in some capacity. Um, you know, Periscope was one team I worked really closely with before and, and even after their acquisition by Twitter. And then most recently, actually, on Monday, my team and I launched a, uh, a new business called Prefer. And Prefer is intended to help you find all the professionals you need from people you know. So I'm constantly thinking about new interfaces and helping either found or invest in design-centric teams. And I think that so far, you know, one takeaway I've had from recent experiences is that the first mile of the customer's experience is woefully neglected. And actually, that's what we're going to talk about in the time we have available to us right now. So let's talk product, because we have a very limited amount of time. Um, we all know that the more obvious a product looks, the harder it was to actually create. Why is this? It kind of goes back to that graph we were looking at in the beginning, where at the beginning of something, you're like, oh, we have a simple solution to something, and that's what helps you get off the ground. And then as you address problems and challenges over the course of time, you just add solutions to those problems that create complexity in your product. And I think that's why so many products are so difficult to use. And so you know, we want to defy the whims of this journey and actually ground product decisions with very simple convictions in order to keep them simple. And uh, now one of those simple convictions for me has always been around time. You know, life is basically just time and how you use it. And you could argue that probably every product that we use either spends our time or saves us time. I mean, think about a few examples. 
Uh, these are obviously products that spend time. You know, we're just playing games or on social networking or watching news or you know playing with Snapchat. These are consuming our time. And then there are some products that are truly designed to save time. You know, whether it be um, Slack, you know, and team email communications, Uber getting from A to B, Evernote recollecting something. And then there are some products that kind of save time and spend time at the same time. You know, Twitter, you can consume news by just reading the headlines, so it saves you time. But it also, of course, spends, uh, spends time. And I think the same could be argued for a company like Brew Apron or a Amazon. You're spending time, but in a more efficient way. Um, but, uh, you know, th this, this construct, though, around time means that we're always fighting, you know, to either save time or we're being seduced to spend our time at all times. And I think this is true for you know, every product that we use in our life. But the only exception is when natural human tendencies kick in. It's the only chance for us to lose track of whether we're saving or losing time on both sides. And, and these are some natural human tendencies that I think about a lot, like to accomplish more with minimal effort, to get recognized, to preserve options for yourself, to look good. These are just almost basic instincts that transcend our attention around time. And so I actually feel like these natural human tendencies, you could argue, are the twilight zone for time. And so I want to thought, you know, think about this a little bit with you here. Um, if you can think around the natural human tendencies of your customers, you know, how can you really win, them, win their time and, and build a product that lasts? And so here are, three human, here are sort of three insights around these human tendencies that I wanted you to think about. The first is that in the first 15 seconds of every customer experience with your product or service, your customers are lazy, they're vain, and they're selfish. Now, of course, if they get engaged with your brand and the promise of your product over the long term, that's no longer true. But it is in that first mile of their experience. They're lazy in the sense that they have no time to read you know, your tours or to learn something new. So these bad onboardings that we see in so many different products or instructional videos, more than line, one line of copy, they will not even read it, research suggests. So what do we try to do? We try to show customers something instead of explaining it to them. You know, we just, or uh, vers with like tool tips, we just kind of like show things to them. The only thing better than showing something to our customer is actually doing something for them. So through templates or presumptuous defaults. And I love this saying that uh, my friend Dave Marin likes to say, which is that the devil is in the defaults. Whatever your customer sees when they load up your product or service, most, most often than not, they're just going to stick with it. And so you have to, carefully, carefully design what the default is, it's most likely what they'll continue using. In the first 15 seconds, customers are vain. We're all vain, right? In the sense that we want to know something is going to make us look good and quickly. I love using the term ego analytics with teams. I always ask them, so what are the ego analytics in your product that help the customer know that they're successful, that it's making them look good, that it's serving them in some way? I mean, look at Instagram. It's interesting, you know, we're always like logging in Instagram, and what do we see at first, or, or Periscope? You know, we see like these hearts when someone is looking at our broadcast. In Instagram, we see people hearting our, 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 our additions to Instagram. And if you look at the stats around a lot of products like this, what you realize is that logins go up dramatically after someone posts a new piece of content. So you think that people go to see new content in Instagram, they're actually going to see who saw their content. And so it's one of those interesting insights in social consumer products, which is that they're as much about who is seeing your content as it is about seeing others' content. And so you have to design the ego analytics into your product in order for them to succeed. The third reason why these 15 seconds you know, are so important is because people are so selfish in those 15 seconds. They need to benefit quickly without spending any time on it. Users are very skeptical of these long-term promises we give them. They want to know how a product gives them value now. And so, you know, I, I think back to Pinterest, which is now known as this very powerful discovery tool. But in the early days, Ben was trying to make a utility for each of us to have our own personal collections. And there was this immediate utility that came before the long-term promise of wanting to discover other people's stuff. Um, I think that the, the, uh, the advent of Slack you know, when Slack was first introduced, people were really engaging with it out of novelty. They were playing with animated GIFs with their teams and stuff like that before they were actually taking it seriously as a workplace product. 
And so you see some of the value propositions of different companies we use, you know, Stripe, get paid faster, or the developer documentation for companies, uh, companies like Stripe, where, or Square or Stripe, you know, where it's like two lines of code or whatever, on the developer side, like, you're appealing to the selfishness of the developer. This better give me a very, you know, a great return for my time and super, super quickly. Um, so I, I would always argue, therefore, that marketing and copy should probably be born out of the product team. You know, if these things are so important, if the first mile is so important, why isn't more copy done by the design and product team when, in fact, it's part of the end-to-end -end user experience of a product? Human tendency number two is that we don't like making choices. Um, and, uh, in fact, we don't even want choices to begin with, oftentimes. And I think that one of the things we learn if you, do, if you create a lot of digital products is you realize that the more options you give the user, the more problems you're going to actually end up having. And so you, know, you wonder why this product life cycle is so true, where users flock to a simple product. Everyone's so excited about something new that's so simple. That company takes its users for granted and starts adding more complexities as they entertain the needs of power users. And then what happens next? Users flock to simple product. And this is kind of that natural life cycle of so many digital products out there. And so the question is, how do we actually defy it? Making simple is really, really complicated. Even more complicated is actually staying simple, is making sure that you ground with these like basic convictions, these human tendencies. So one of the things I always implore teams to do is to actually preserve 50% of their focus on the new user's experience even later on, because if you think about it, the new users that come into a product even years after it's launched are different than the new user cohort that came in in the beginning. The beginning new users are early adopters, the later new users are pragmatists, and so you have to think about that. You have to prioritize these problems for new users over always trying to solve the new problems of power users. The third tendency I just wanted to talk about real quickly is that we favor novelty yet we cling to familiarity. Everyone says they love innovation, but everyone wants things that they're actually familiar with. We love to find things that, we're rec that we recognize. And um, I think this was really termed best by Seth Godin, who called it the lizard brain. It's this ancestral part of our brain that always makes us go towards whatever we actually recognize. And so in the beginning of Behance, we tried to be very original with our product. We were actually making it for creative people. We figured, why not be innovative and creative with our own terminology. And so we called things creative fields and, and circles, uh, realms and circles, rather. And then we realized over the years, if we called realms creative fields, or if we called circles groups, people just used them more. And so it's one of those things of like, don't try to create your own terminology. Use familiar patterns uh, whenever you possibly can. Uh, innovation is great, but if you think about it, uh, familiarity is actually the friend of utilization. People will use something a lot when they're actually familiar with it. I looked around my apartment before coming here, and I found a few examples of this. Uh, I have some remotes with lots of buttons, but there's a party mode, and it just like very elegantly describes exactly what that does. It's a familiar, a familiar term, and you kind of know what that means. Um, looking at avocados with these like stickers on it, just familiarizing yourself with different colors and terminology, what it means. I, I love my toaster. There is a button that says a bit more on it, which is just so smart. It's just like, this is exactly the familiar you know, pattern that they're trying to. They could have all these other whizzy buttons on it, but they don't. Um, so you really want to adopt familiar patterns when, whenever possible, whenever possible, and only force unique behaviors that power a really unique value for your product. And a good example was with Periscope, it came out in the age of all the selfies and stuff like that. And uh, people said, well, why would, why would you ship an app that's in the selfie generation that opens default facing out rather than facing in? And it was really the insight of the team thinking, we want to build a digital product that is like teleportation. And so the default is going to be facing out. And we're going to retrain users to think in a different way when they use our product versus all the other selfie, video to video, peer to peer products out there. So I would actually argue that the best, most transformational products out there that get tons and tons of users are 90% accommodating to familiar tendencies, things that are familiar to all of us, and only 10% retraining, only 10% forcing some sort of new behavior that is kind of uncomfortable or not native to us. So what do we learn here, since I'm out of time, 
um, product engagement is really all about the fight for time and actually harnessing these natural tendencies, paying attention to them and thinking about them in that first mile of your customer's user experience. You should have faith in your customers, of course. Build a relationship with them. But in the first 15 seconds, don't feel like they owe you anything. They will not give you the time of day unless you meet them where they are, which is a very selfish place. Stay grounded by the newest customer's experience. So don't think that just because you figured out the onboarding for the, the early customers when you launch the product, that that's what should work or will work a year from now. It won't. You have to continue to go back to the newest customer's experience. Innovation is great so long as the core mechanics and the language are familiar. Always ground yourself with the familiar in order to make sure that people actually utilize what you're building. Um, so human tendencies, I mean, these are things that actually defy ideals. They defy the hopes and dreams that we have for our customers. And you're creating for people. So I think what we all have to do is just be as human as we possibly can. And uh, thank you for having me.